Today's guest is Julia, and Julia is a returning guest and a mental health first aider. At the beginning of the podcast, we do talk a little bit about politics because kind of at the moment that really is causing a lot of stress and a lot of mental health issues for a lot of people. But we do swiftly move into actual mental health, mental health advocacy, signs of mental health. And as always, when I talk to Julia, it's very informative. I hope you enjoy it. All of the links that we discussed are in the description. So please do check them out. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the David Watson podcast. It's great to see you again. How are you? I'm very well, David. Um, it's lovely to be back. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this time I've even managed to change my, my computer name from William to Julia. So uh, I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm representing myself as opposed to my nine-year-old son today, which is very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so we can, yeah. <laughs> as, which is, someone. as we've discussed before, the limit of our technology is limited. You know. absolutely absolutely i We're, just wasn't paying attention when we uh <laughs> we set up last time but hey it's good it is good to have you back and funnily enough we were just before we started the countdown it, to actually start the podcast we were just talking about mental health and durability which is kind of absolutely. handy seeing as you're uh, a mental health instructor first aid I instructor am. i should add <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, de definitely more focused than just general mental health, which would be um, very exciting, but epic. Um, yeah, I, I am, have been doing it for several years now, and um, there is uh, an increased need at the moment. Um, there is no doubt of that. Um, a lot of businesses looking to, to, to get support, get greater understanding, which is um, great news. Um, well, we, we're in November now, aren't we? So October was uh, anxiety and depression month. Um, with sort of focus in, into mental health in particular. And it was really great working with some of the businesses doing workshops for their employees on what to look out for and how best to, to support an individual. But it is, even though I'm, I'm focusing on quite a small pocket of mental health, it is still a, a huge subject. Um, and yeah, I'm no therapist that uh, I'll leave to the, the lovely Karen, Caroline Kavanagh's of this world, but- uh, Indeed. A big, big subject, um, yes. I think last time we spoke about all sorts of different parts, didn't we? The stresses of life, um, COVID, um, all sorts of other things. Yeah, we do, because we were right in the middle of the pandemic at the time. And, and one of the things that we discussed is what would that mean kind of moving forward? And nobody could predict what was going to happen because we were still in the middle of lockdowns. Um, yeah. And I think, if I remember correctly, you were in the middle of homeschooling. Um, and but it was interesting because, like, like I said, just before we uh, started recording, we were talking about durability, and we're now kind of, in some respects, I think there was an aspect to the lockdown that was slightly easier, because you were under a microscope that was being controlled, and the parameters were very strict. Whereas now we're in a position where we're told the dangers are still the same, but you all need to get on with it. And it's it's kind of, I think, put a lot of people in a difficult position, especially people who... So I think I discussed in the first uh, part of the podcast that we did that, just to clarify again, because I work in healthcare, it had very little impact on me. You know, yeah. the PPE, well, you typically wear that when you're doing personal care anyway. So not any great difference. We were in it, I'm in and out of people's houses, I'm traveling around. I do everything I've ever done. I ever did before the lock, ever uh, any lockdowns before any COVID. So it literally had zero impact on my life in the terms of the day to day stuff. It had a greater impact on not seeing friends, members of family that I couldn't see. Um, but in terms of what I do Monday to Friday, weekends, it had no impact at all. Whereas for other people, it was a complete difference. Whereas I am still going to work every day. I'm still seeing mm. people, the same people every day. I'm still going to the shops for clients. I'm still going to the pharmacist. I'm still attending doctor's appointments. It's just like, no, nothing, nothing changed. A lot less traffic, which was nice. And But for everyone else, it was a massive difference because some people were 
completely isolated and stuck in bubbles. Some people were working from home, but still had a bubble, but, you know, did get some interaction with people from Zoom. But a large impact was people just never leaving their house, never leaving their homes and getting that cabin fever. Again, yeah. never affected me at all because I'm still driving to work and back. You know, I think you're right. And I think you made a very valid point at the beginning there that actually there was a sense of, um, I think there was more of a sense of us all being in it together, at, yeah. you know, in the beginning, because those that were, were locked down, um, we, we were all locked down together. Um, and those that were um, going back their business were key workers, people at front line. There were people that, you know, very much have, have aided our, our communities and supported us and, and looked after us. Um, so there is a real sense of, you know, actually, I want, I want to keep them safe. I want to look after them. How can we work together as a, as a group to, to um, get through this as best we can? And you, you mentioned there's a, you know, a sort of greater sense of confusion now. And I think it has been very difficult as a you know, do you turn up at the, in my case, the school playground um, and some people wearing masks and some people aren't. Um, and actually over time, more and more people have, have removed their masks as we're all waiting outdoors. Um, and now actually for the few people that are wearing masks, it almost feels like you're criticising those that aren't. So there's now a sort of, you know, so you're forever sort of, you know, wondering guiltily whether you should be wearing it or whether actually that's now somehow you're, you're kind of slighting someone who isn't. Um, and it, the, the whole just generally, I think there is a much sort of greater sense of um, those that, that do just, you know, I've been double jabbed, I feel I need to get on with it. And those that are still very anxious, those that people have sick relatives. Um, I was talking to someone this morning who um, has elderly parents and they have never been so anxious before um, because, of course, everyone is moving about and they're desperate to see their grandchildren, but there is a greater sense of uh, vulnerability and frailty. Um, and I think she used the word of, um, of, of sort of a, an appreciation of um, the preciousness of life and how, how, how quickly we've, we've lost so many people unexpectedly and in those tragic circumstances where you couldn't even really sort of say goodbye or hold their hand or, or offer them any comfort. Um, and that, that part of grief is also then not allowed to, to heal quite so well because, you know, you, you've had to say goodbye on a phone call or you get visited or, you know, get a call from the, the nurses saying, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, they're, they've gone. Um, and, and and that really is incredibly difficult for an awful lot of people. Well, for anyone, I mean, what a horrendous way to, to, to lose to lose a loved one. Yeah, I'm in the middle of uh, listening to Darren Brown's latest book and mm. he talks about his dad dying in the middle of the pandemic and how there was a limit to how many people could attend the service. And when he went to visit his mum, they weren't allowed to, because all the social distancing was still in place. So he was, mm -hmm. he could sit, he had to sit two metres away from his mum. He wasn't even allowed to give his own mum a hug. Yeah. And you kind of sort of, well, at what cost is... Absolutely. And, and I, I do think that, that that's always going to be a difficult one to quantify. But it's because different people have different values, you know. And how do you say to somebody, I'm sorry, but you can't console your mother, brother, yeah. sister, or anything, because there's a pandemic going on. And there, there is that kind of like, well, I, I don't care. It's not worth that to me. I'd rather risk catching something then not be able to be part of my family unit. And it is, and you were saying a thing about the mask. I took my mum shopping the other day, and quite clearly I don't do this often, because we went to go into the shop, and she went, oh, hang on, I've just got to get my mask on. And I was like, do you still wear a mask? She goes, yeah. Every time I go shopping, I'm, you know, she'll walk around the street without the one on, but as soon as she goes into a, a, a public building, she puts a mask on. And I was just like, yeah. I did not know, you know, I didn't know that about my own mum. And... And like you say, you say, oh, and I said to her, I said, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or, you know, I said, it's not, not a judgment and it genuinely wasn't. I just mm. didn't realise that my mum was still wearing a mask and yeah, had never, yeah. never actually thought about asking her because the, the day they changed said, you don't have to wear one anymore. I stopped wearing one because yeah. I wear them at work anyway. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like... Uh, it, it's a but just that. And, and that's it, isn't it? And I, I sort of find myself, so last night we were at the cinema and I didn't wear it in the cinema, but I wore it into the auditorium and then took it off. 
Um, and there, there are just moments where you're like, this is, you know, I'm, I'm walking into a coffee shop and I'm covered up and then I take it off at the table. Um, and then there was that one shop where I just got to put it on altogether. Um, and of course, you know, it's there quite a few, um, I think when we went into Waterstones, they had, you know, we kindly ask you to wear a mask. And um, I think I'd worn it in that shop, but then there was a double, you know, and you, you do, you constantly sort of feel that you're slightly out of kilter with the world because you, you're not entirely sure what you're doing. Yeah, when it first... <laughs> it's almost clearer when they said just wear a mask, or you know, and, and then now that we have this, don't, don't, but we'd like you to. Um, yeah, because you know, area. When, when it first started, I was very conscious of okay, the law has now changed and we don't have to wear one anymore. But yeah. I carried one because I didn't want to interfere with a shop owner's preferences. Yeah, you know, so it was just like if a shop owner said, "Oh, we like you to wear a mask," I always had a mask with me and I'd put it on. I had no interest in arguing with people about it. It's just, if that's your preference, it's fine with me. You know, I can put one on. But then as time went on and on and we got a little bit further down the line, I still have a mask in my car, but I forget to ever put it in my pocket. You know, and I just got to the point now, it's just like, I don't know what I'd do if somebody said, oh, actually, I'd prefer if you put a mask on because I'm like, uh, I haven't got one. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. And that's because there is this sort of, you know, just um, almost a lack of clarity, isn't it? And yeah. that can, can be very anxious for some people and for other people, you know, the, the whole thing now just feels rather ridiculous um, in, in so much as we've come so far and our population is so well vaccinated that, um, yeah, I think it, it causes a, a sort of um, a difficulty in our society, which is a, is a pity because um, obviously actually we, we kind of need to be working close together um, and supporting people and that's quite difficult when when people sort of have you know so some people get quite upset about it and other people you know just um are not bothered what anyone else is doing anyway they just so so it doesn't matter to them it is it is difficult because i mean you you pretty much kind of summed it up there there's people who that are passionate about it and i think it's one of the and there's like you said there's people that couldn't give a monkeys um i I'd say I'd fall into the category of I'm not really that fussed, but I'm smart enough or aware enough to be sensitive to other people, you know. Um, but very early on, I remember watching something, uh, some export, expert in virology in an interview, and he said, it's an airborne virus. Trying to stop it is like trying to stop the wind. And for whatever reason, that just made me thought. It's a strange one because I was just like, well, I'm powerless to do anything about this. And that didn't make me panic. It just made me think, oh, I can't, I can't, there's nothing I can do. You know, I work in healthcare, so I had the vaccines, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion one way or the other about them. Just, no, they're on offer, take them. You know, you get chucked to the front of the queue because of your job, take them, be grateful for that. Um, if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. Again, I've just left it with the fact of, it just sticks in my head, there's nothing you can do about an airborne virus. So I'm just like, right then, <laughs> fingers crossed, <laughs> we'll all be all right. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. I, I mean, I'm not a virologist, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'll argue one way or the other, but... Um, well, it just, uh, for some reason, it just left me with this, it's beyond my control, mm -hmm. so just get on with your life. And I think because of that, I've been quite relaxed about it all, but I do kind of understand when people... And it's, it's, that, it's that line, isn't it? That there's always a kind of a line for everybody. It's... I think, like I said, when masks first come off, I carried one with me in case I came across a shop owner or I went to visit somebody and there was preferences to, oh, we'd really like you to wear a mask. Absolutely. That's not a problem at all. You know, I I'm not here to offend or upset anybody. But then there's that also, there's that, I think sometimes now you get both sides where have dug themselves into a trench and they're not going to move for anyone, whereas... You should have one on whether you like it or not because you've got to respect other people and other people, it's my freedom to do what I want and I'm not doing anything. <laughs> it's like, okay, guys, yeah. how, how do we find a nice happy medium in the middle here? Yeah? Well, exactly, exactly. And I think there's a, a big need at the moment for just, just trying to find happy mediums with, with, with all sorts of things that are going on at the moment. Um, it's uh, yeah, important to try and um, calm anxieties whether that's about climate change or mask wearing or um or all, all sorts of different things and agendas that are going on yeah climate change <laughs>
Well, climate change has been another one that's kind of spikes emotions like yeah, worse. Absolutely. You know, and, you, and there's no. Um, I was having a conversation about this with somebody the other day, and um, yeah, there, there was no. He, I, so just to be fair, I'm not a big supporter of of uh, COP26. I'm not. It's not my. There's the the difference between pollution, population control. Do you know what I mean? Overpopulation of the planet, pollution and climate change is they're all for me very different distinct arguments and this idea that all of these countries get to get together and spend billions and billions of pounds is going to fix a problem i'm very cynical about that <laughs> very very cynical well, about we're that all slightly cynical about because i mean the, the, the fact is that because of the way our countries are run none of them are incentivized really to do anything about it because the the sad thing is at the end of the day no one wants to see their taxes go up and that's what it's going to take. And that's that's the same across pretty much anything. If you want to spend a lot of money, it's got to come from somewhere. And actually, you don't get another political vote in and your party doesn't win votes by saying to people, hey, I'm going to charge you a lot more money. No. Um, and no. You know, whether that's for, for, for you know climate change or whether that's for healthcare or you know building new schools, whatever it might be, however much. I mean, there's so much investment needed in this country at the moment. It's a breaking point. But... Um, with this, they're talking about, I mean, like they continually talk about climate change and we can continually build houses on habitats. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe we stop, need to stop pulling concrete out of the ground, which is one of the largest sort of, uh, producers of CO2 and putting houses, you know, I, 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 where I live in Ainsbury, they're, they're trying to get planning permission for 1200 houses right next to a site that's been uh, a site of designated scientific interest for about the last 50 years. And you now want to put 1,200 houses on it. Right. Pretty sure that's going to contribute to this climate change you're telling us when you're going to stop. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's nuts, isn't it? It is. And, you know, habit, again, they chuck in habitat destruction. Well, ham, that's not climate change. Climate change is different, different to habitat destruction. Climate change is different to man-made plastics and pollutions. And there's a thing they used to teach us in school. It's called the Milo Jokovic or Milo. And I've, I've got it on my phone. I'll see if I can find it. But it's a cycle to do with climate change. And they, it was discovered in 1920. And they used to teach this, teach us the Milan Kokovic cycles. And it, it just, it is, it's, it's, it's a scientific description of, of how we go through these, these cycles of climate change. But again, that, that's different to all of the other issues we have. Do you know what I mean? Like deforestation and things like that. There are things that we do to contribute to it. And then there's things that we can do to just make the planet a much better place. And I just, again, I'm being cynical maybe, but I just don't think the governments are the one to, to drive this forward. No, no. It's, um, especially our... <laughs> anyway, anyway, I won't give my political views on that. But uh, yeah, no, there's... I, I hope I hope they make some very positive changes because potentially the UK actually has um, a lot of technical knowledge in sort of niche markets and potentially this could be a great you know the renewables market could be something that we could really really nail. Yeah. And, I think and uh, actually, yeah I was going to say I think we're something like the fourth cleanest country in the world. Are we? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. Um, and I'm not even a, um, like when they say like, well, it doesn't matter unless you sort out China, Russia or India. I don't, not even that. Sometimes you just have to be the beacon of light that shows the way, shows yeah. the alternative ways, you know. So I'm happy for us to sit up and take that position. It just, I, I just, I, I'm a cynic when it comes to any time governments get together from around the world and say, we're going to fix this problem. It's like, yeah, I ain't going to make the problem, but I hope I'm wrong. You know. Yeah, but back to mental health. <laughs> Probably more my area of expertise as opposed to uh, climate politics. <laughs> yeah. So what? So what have you noticed since we've kind of like last spoke? Has there been themes of anxiety and stuff coming through? Um, yes, um, anxiety is it's gone up considerably. Um, and actually, I think what is so, so sort of harking back to our conversation there, it's noticeable that there is more of a, a, a fragmentation in society. 
and therefore you have different groups of people who are now worrying about lots of, of different areas um, and a sort of the, the I mean, I don't, I don't really see how you could change the lack of clarity we have at the moment um, to anything else. It is just one of the stages we need to move through in whether it's going to get worse again or better. You know, there have got to be stages in between. So, so this is where we are. Um, but I think there is, because the NHS is still hugely overwhelmed um, by a lot of COVID cases that are still coming in, there is still, I mean, that we, we all know the, the huge queues that are now building up for, for missed surgeries, for um, illnesses that haven't been spotted, for, um, you know, routine things that, that were supposed to take place um, and increasingly sort of larger health risks, um, whether it's, you know, cancer or stroke or um, the crisis. I think it's now every single county um, has an ambulance issue of sort of potential wait times. Was it 15 minutes? It was quite huge, wasn't it? Yeah, some of them were quite bad. Shocking! It's sort of hard. I remember back in the eighties when there was a sort of um, you used to have to wait hours, of six, seven hours, if you went to A and E. Um, so actually, we've been going through this this wonderful period where our hospitals have been um, on really good form. We just didn't really appreciate it, but we can fully appreciate it now that our our hospitals are are really struggling. And the upshot of that, from the mental health point of view, of course, is. Um, that what we talked about last time, a key part of advice is, is to go start with your doctor and have those conversations there and then trust in the system. But the system is now so overwhelmed by um, the amount of things that are going on, um, you know, all the, all the different health cases that are, are waiting. Uh, the queues are massive. So the feedback that I get very much from, from people that are on my courses and, and from those people that I know in the medical sector is that we're asking for help, but we, we can't. Um, or we're, we're trying to provide help, but actually they're just, there are just too many. Um, in the meantime, of course, you know, Brexit has, has seen a, a huge drop in the workforce. There's a greater strain in the pool of labour we have, and it takes it takes time to retrain new nurses and new doctors. Um, so we have less people, more demand. Um, so the, 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 the thing we're now leaning towards in the mental health side is very much actually the, the extraordinary charities and organisations that work in every single county um, and the support they can provide. And actually it comes down more into you know, the hope that more people are mentally health aware and trained um, or first aiders. Um, I mean, there's some amazing organisations locally that do everything from, um, there's a sort of local pipe farm, but a, a sort of uh, an area that you can go and you can help feed animals um, and, and, you know, the, the gardening side and, and sort of um, smaller crops growing vegetables um, and be part of that. And actually, they've had a, a real success with individuals turning up, not wanting to talk at all, but just wanting to be given a, a sort of manual task to, to, to focus on. And then gradually over time, building up friendships, building up those connections and, and having really heartfelt conversations with people who aren't necessarily trained therapists, but with whom they've built a connection with. Um, and actually, a lot of there's a chap called Johan Hari who wrote an excellent book called Lost Connections. And so many times, the, the lovely Brenny Brown, um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of her. Um, oh, she's excellent. Um, I'll, I'll send you a couple of links. Um, Power of Vulnerability is very good and her Empathy versus Sympathy um, YouTube clip, brilliant. I've seen um, that, I have seen that. That might have been something that you and I talked about last time. It might well have been. Because I think I uh, looked at it after that. Yeah. If it wasn't you, it was somebody else mentioned that on a podcast and it made me look that up. Cause that, was a, that was a video that went viral. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of her, her work does because she's she, she's got a wonderful ability of being someone who not only has um, a real interest in science and drilling down and having the facts and the figures and really trying to make sense of the science behind it, but she's a wonderful storyteller as well. So actually she can then translate as opposed to coming up with sort of, you know, rather lengthy, complex graphs and terminology. Um, she turns the whole thing into a conversation, which then actually becomes incredibly engaging and, and very interesting to listen, listen to um, and comprehensible, which is the, you know, because that thing. is often very difficult, isn't it? Because it's not unknown that you get somebody who's academically a genius, but trying to communicate that in an artistic form isn't their point so when you get the two combined you know you, you kind of get the perfect coalition if you like where oh no I, yeah. i'm a really smart person who knows how to put this across yeah 
absolutely and, and what a breath of fresh air that is because then all of a sudden actually you know you're, you're um someone like me has access to information and, and, and understanding that's way above you know the level of, of learning i have in those topics um but i can trust in the science it's, it's not you know something that she's imagined or a theory she has that's unsupported it's it's based on research um, and then interest and i think i mean something that the uh, johan hari book relates to is um that an awful lot of research that's done is is perpetuated by um very large um corporations uh, a lot of whom have pharmaceutical interests or uh, an agenda behind it and of course that means that the results and the research you see is is very much based on whatever question they're asking um which is probably going to be lent on slightly or slanted slightly to, for, for, for their interests so um a huge amount of English research is, is is paid for by pharmaceutical companies which there is, was a um, oh i'm trying to think who was who the interview was but he pointed out that certainly when it comes to the fitness side of the health industry every study was paid for by somebody that had an interest in it and yeah. and we're seeing this and again i i'm not i'm not trying to call anyone out but we're seeing this um there was a couple of d d documentaries on netflix there was the one about the sea and all the fish but then when they traced it back it was <laughs> all of the everything about the the documentary was um sponsored by animal rights activist groups and you just like and i, I swear anybody has I, i'm sorry i can't remember the name of the documentary but if you haven't seen it it is fascinating and frightening the problem yeah. with it is it calls out everybody it calls out is actually in opposition to them so you yeah. get caught with well how truthful or how reliable is the documentary and yeah. it's the same as there was one about red meat recently but it was done by it was sponsored by the company that's trying to bring out plant-based meats and I well you're, you've created a, a documentary slagging off the very product you're trying to put out of business. I'm not yeah. sure how ethical that is. And and this is like you're saying, a lot of these studies that come out are, pharma, are sponsored by the, pharma, uh, the pharmacies, the pharma, pharmaceutical companies. And it, it's, you know, that famous one about sugar, uh, mm. no, sorry, fat being bad for you, but sugar was okay, was famously sponsored by... Uh, sugar corporations, but also by a doctor who had an interest in that. You know, yeah. uh, I think it was in the seventies or so. I forgot what the the doctor was called, but it's when we started changing to sugar, a sugar-based diet, and got rid of fats because they, they slagged off fats, and it turned out it was completely biased. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, it's it's a real pity actually because you lose some really good information because there is no. I mean, there'll be a doubt where you know there there are there are very important times when. Um, Sort of having a, a medical um, solution to something, uh, a, a medicine-based solution. So whether that's, uh, you know, Prozac or, or a, a tablet of some sort is the only answer and a very vital one. So at no point am I trying to undermine that. Um, it's just that unfortunately there is very little money to show um, or to pay for research into things that show that working um, in areas where you are sort of, you know working the land or doing yeah. something that grows something or something productive, you know, gardening. Um, lots of people enjoying it. I actually find it quite therapeutic. Um, and where you get sort of communities together and they work together to achieve something, there is so many health benefits, but there's very, very little research that goes into that because you know, it takes funding and um, the rewards from it are, are sort of negligible. You know, how do you, how do you work? Who's going to benefit out of that? Who's going to make a profit? So. Um, it's true. Yeah, you know, get the support it needs, um, but there's no doubt. And actually, I think a lot of it, you know, we know in our, in our heart of hearts, you know, if you go out and you take exercise or you get together with someone and you know you go out and try and construct something together or build something or take on a challenge together with someone, um, both the sense of doing it as a unit for each other um, and achieving whatever task you've set out to do together is is a real a real boon and a real sense of. Um, self-esteem based confidence so you know it is pressure. and it's also interesting as well because we know as well that humans naturally take the path of least resistance and lack discipline yeah. and the very thing that we we need is a sort of hardship we kind of need a something that to get you know like we, we know that 
quick gratification long term doesn't do us any good. It actually makes yeah. us impatient. It ma makes us intolerant of anything that takes time to achieve. Um, and we automate everything. We make everything as simple as we can. Yeah. And like you said, we know that exercise is good for us. We know that being outside is good for us. Uh, we know that um, your your basic standard natural meat and veg diets are good for us. You know, for for majority of people, you know, there, there was always exceptions to those rules. But th th there's a simplicity to life that we we know yeah. um, is good for us. But it's often means discipline, which is what we don't naturally take well with. To, um, and again, it's, oh, it's, God, you are really political today, aren't we? Governments don't do anything, <laughs> don't do anything to inter introduce this or make it. You know, as you know, they they, they sell off school playgrounds, um, and this is historically every government I've ever known has done this. You know, they don't do nothing about investing in playing fields, like school after school activities. You know, but then even to, I mean, they have both, you know, the last two governments have been pretty good at giving out free gym memberships to people that are overweight and obese and, and stuff like that for a period of time. But we're not proactive in, like, when Jamie Oliver famously was trying to get a sugar tax put in place to just, like, basically make it unaffordable to buy kids sweets. But kids aren't the ones that have a problem with sweets because they're growing. They'll, they'll take as much sugar as you can give them. They're fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's when you're an adult and stop growing because you then just go outwards. <laughs> well, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and yeah. it's it's adults that need that, um, you know, like people like you and I that need to kind of have something that incentivizes us to have some self-discipline. And absolutely. most times that you incentivize an adult is to make it expensive yeah absolutely and unfortunately it's um you know there, there there's so many adverts we're bombarded by by all these things that we're you know could make us happy um and it, it tends to encourage a lifestyle of short-lived sort of very brief, brief pleasure and buying what, whatever product it is that you need to um and a sort of attitude of, of um a fairly uh, low exercise lifestyle um, where you know cutting up watching TV and eating chocolate is, is sort of more, heaven <laughs> well, I quite enjoy it um, <laughs> but you know it, it's very difficult but, but you know if I take my kids for example they, they, they really like Minecraft and actually it's a very very seductive game um, and you know there, there's lots of positives to it and sort of learning how to, to sort of program and their understanding of all these commands and the worlds they build are amazingly creative. The architecture is incredible. Um, I'm, he, my son showed me his world yesterday. I was, I was blown away by some of the ideas and the, the things he'd done there. Um, but as a parent, then trying to persuade them to go out for a bike ride, you know, why would I want to do something so mundane on a grey, wet, you know, dreary November afternoon when I could be curled up on the sofa, you know, sucking a lolly and watching Minecraft? And it's like, mm. yes, <laughs> it it's a hard crazy. argument. So, so much larger and of course actually from, from a mental health point of view you know those those are the very worst things that the kids come off and they're usually sort of angry because they've been so caught up in this world and you know the real world then actually is a bit dull um and less colorful and less bright and they have less control over it so it's it, it's it's a real it's a real tough one as a parent to try and decide do i allow my child um the pleasures and the abilities and he can get online he, he sets up with his friends who he doesn't see very often um, and has communication with them and it's it's great they play these games but they also come off you know totally sort of wired um and it is a case of right out in the garden go run it off because they 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 do go just spare and crawl up the walls after that it is difficult though isn't it because like you say so the reason these things are so addictive is because they're actually interesting you know yeah. try, try, trying to hold a, a child or a teenager's attention is nigh on impossible and these people okay you know they know how to do it and but they have that's the point though isn't it It holds their attention and gives them something to do so they never have a boredom threshold which we've now found out boredom threshold is something that's vital to understand life and moving into adulthood and trust me when you get a 40 hour week job you'll want to know how to live with boredom but <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but it is, it's, I, I guess it all comes down to how we manage these things, isn't it? It's so, I mean, as a mental health first aider, what would you say people like if they're, if they're worried about their own anxiety or their own mental health or about that of somebody else without being like, too intrusive to somebody, what would you say the, the, the first steps you can do for pre preventative measures? Um, so if you were to come back, okay, you know, so a, a conversation um, is, is, a, is a fundamental starting point um, to not be afraid of, of, of having that sort of opening chat of, you know, hey, I've noticed um, this change of behavior, you know, you know, everyone knows mm. where, what they, their friends or their loved ones are, you know, their, their normal um, behaviors. So actually seeing that shift in behavior and, and questioning it and not being afraid if they then reject you um, or get cross or get upset because they may need time. Um, and but you're just being able to say, you know, doors open if you ever want to come and have a chat. Um, or if I'm not the right person to have a chat with, you know, do, do have a chat with someone. It might be that they need to go and have that first conversation with the doctor as well. I think last time we talked about how often um, a mental health issue might be a physical health issue that's, um, I think we talked about, is it cortisone levels? Or yeah. We're, we're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, and it has a mental reaction or a, a reaction that shows in your emotions and your, your sense of well being. Um, so, it's important to go and have a, a conversation about that. Um, if, if it's something like a panic attack, um, you may, if, if it's something they've experienced before, um, then actually just, just be sort of honest with you, you know, what it will have you had a mental uh, a panic attack before um what's what's your normal course of action you know, do you have a, a special breathing technique and, and then sort of working with them on on they tell you that they do square breathing or um five breathing or whatever it might be that actually then work with them about um sort of going through that so it's it's sort of something we would we do on the course to, to look at different sort of structures or it may be actually that they have their own they just want some space but you can reassure them that they're in a safe space so um but all the different types of mental health they, they all have slightly different but it all starts with a conversation and that offer of support um and that being willing willing to, to walk with someone along that path for a while to, to, to help them through it so and a lack of one of the things i'd like to ask you i had this conversation with a uh, a mental health first aider recently on on the podcast uh a lady called Kathy Chillerstone, and she's down in the Isle of Wight. And we actually, which, you know, it's just passed on Sunday, we were talking about the kind of the standard British issue of stiff upper lip. And yeah, one of the I'm things... Fine. Yeah, but one of the things I point out is that stiff upper lip came from a necessity. I think it was, and I could be very wrong about this, but it, it effectively came around because of the wars around the late 19th century, First World War, Second World War. Is it was a necessity that is it's misunderstood when people today say come on pull, pull your big boy pants up stiff up a lip it, it was never meant to be like that it's, you actually had to get people to climb over the top of a trench and run into gunfire watching the, yeah. the people next to them get shot and just as gruesome as it sounds and as drastic as it sounds the commanding officers didn't have any time to know what your feelings were about that <clears throat> literally nobody cared because we're defending our country against the enemy. Yeah. You know, move on to the Second World War. Some of you have already done this, so you're familiar. So I don't expect any shit from you lot. And they would look down at everyone else and say, stiff up our lip, boys, this is what we've got to do. But it was okay. from a necessity, because we were fighting an enemy, you know. And so when they kind of then, the wars were over and things like that, they, they had very much had, well, that's life, son. You know, stiff up a lip that's that's how it moves forward and again when you move forward you know 80 years 70 years whatever it is it's not really the same place we are today but there is a balance between sometimes you need to do what you can to hold yourself accountable the world isn't against you you do have to have some self-responsibility and then there's that line where, no, look, life is getting on top of you, you know, and, and it's a balance. And I'm going to put you on the spot to hand, answer that. Um, yeah, absolutely. 
it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because different people have um, different points at which. So yeah, I don't think there's a right answer. I'm just interested in the uh, feedback right. from it's, different people. Yeah. Um, no, you're you're absolutely right. And there, there is there is a point whereby you know, it, I think the language has changed. Language is such an important thing. Um, the language has changed because when I used to work in London, um, there was no doubt that there would be sort of um, grizzles in the offer of, office if someone had taken time out. You'd, you'd get some really sort of unkind remarks. Um, and actually, there, there's a I'm, I'm teaching an awareness course in a couple of weeks' time, and we, we one of the first things we look at is is language and how you may have someone. You know, we we look at we split language down into a negative and positive kind of language, and then stuff that falls into the middle. Um, and so the negative stuff might be um, where someone's referred to as, oh, they're mentally um, disturbed or they're, um, you know, they're being weak or, you know, they're all, they're all sorts of relatively negative conversations. And thankfully, a lot of that language is now um, recognised and, and not, not used. Um, but actually talking about mental health positively is really difficult because you might say, um, Oh, she, she's. Uh, no, I'll talk about me. This hasn't happened to me, but just, just yeah. so that. Yeah. Um, so Julia is um, experiencing uh, poor mental health. Julia um, has had an episode of psychosis. Julia has. Um, so it's the way it starts getting growing. So Julia was a victim of trauma, or she, and then then there's that question. Well, is victim, you know, is that recognizing that she she has had she has suffered? You know, suffering is another one that then falls into that grey area. She's suffering yeah. from mental health um, issues, and so it's it's a it's a really difficult language to navigate. But there there is definitely a shift um, where that whole sort of concept of you know even quite recently you know you get phrases like man up um, and um, that sort of relate back to that stiff upper lip, which was. <laughs> Really, just people not not wanting to have to acknowledge, and this is something that the Brenny Brown empathy versus sympathy yeah. talks about. You actually, have to take on someone else's pain, and the best thing you can do is not try and fill it with your own stories, not try and uh, she uses the word silver lining it, um, but just actually go. That sounds awful. I, I don't know what to say, but thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm here with you. I do have a problem with this, and and this is where I'm going to be very open, and I am a walking contradiction, right? As somebody that has um, talked about wanting to commit suicide, has talked openly about being depressed, there is a point where I would, you, I suppose you could describe me as clinically in trouble, you know, and that I definitely had self-sabotaging habits, I'm an ex-offender, um, I've done copious amounts of drugs, um, I've been bankrupt, you know, so I'm somebody that has kind of, you know, and a lot of that was self-inflicted and I'm in a space now where I recognise my mental health was a huge part of why I was so self-sabotaging. So, and this is why I'm being very open about the fact that I'm a contradiction because I also think there's a place for man up and it's where's the line? Did you do you know I me? Mean? Because there's, and this is what, what I'm trying to always get uh, a dialogue and a feedback about is there's times where people your life isn't as difficult as you think it is okay yeah. and you actually need to stop feeling sorry for yourself and you need to start pulling the big boy pants up stiff up a lip man up get on with it wh whatever you know whatever term you want to use i also think there's a place in society where people need to st stop being so effing sensitive about words mm. now that's one side of me the other side of me is please do not feel you alone please you know like if you're going for a breakup if you're having financial troubles if you're having the, and there's because life can beat you down and you can be the nicest healthiest most stable person going but stress will destroy you you know quicker than a virus <laughs> do you know what I mean? and yeah. and it can have long lasting effects for decades and and it's it's kind of and there's a part of me that worries on one hand we encourage a certain behavior that makes people quite neurotic and narcissistic and when we do that we potentially lose people who we could genuinely help who genuinely need help and and i only say that from my own personal experiences and it, it's how we find that balance of saying of 
because sometimes people need to stop being incent uh, in some sometimes people need to stop being insensitive and other times people need to stop being oversensitive and I guess I'm asking you because I don't know the answers uh, I wouldn't fully know the answer <laughs> but what I would say is it's, it would be very difficult to, to, to know so your, your point at which um, you needed to have that that conversation of okay I just need to pull this this together um, now would have been very different from from so you you might have been um, let's not make it about you so let's say no no um, that's but, no I, um, no no let's make it about me because then do you know what I mean it's, it's relative to people and I'm always happy because I know where I've come from and and how dark that place was I'm always happy to be open about that because I think that is part of helping people as well so the, the help that you would have needed, it would have been very different if someone had come up to you and just said, I'll stop whinging, get on with it. Because actually in some of those places, that could have been the one thing that made you feel totally useless and pushed you over the edge. And this is the thing, we don't know for an individual where that is. I had a conversation quite recently with someone who was um, telling me that there was someone at work and they just kept coming back with the same problem, the same problem and, and constantly... Um, very open about what they'd been through and some some really bored, bad experiences but just seemed to be you know almost attention seeking about it they just yeah. couldn't live yeah. and it was it was wearing and it was sort of like well okay i i get that and it's amazing that you have listened and supported it must be very frustrating because you're kind of going around the same circle all the time but the fact is what you can't see is that every time you go around that circle you're taking that person one step because that's their therapy they haven't worked out. Maybe they don't have the social skills, they don't have the support, they don't know who else to turn to. So they're coming to you because you are currently seemingly their only source of being able to vocalise and try and deal with whatever is going on. And there would obviously been something quite traumatic in the background. Um, and that, so that, that, that person was carrying a considerable weight um, and we talked about how they might be able, because she was so open, it might be possible actually to spread that weight across several people um, and, and involve her in that conversation, not go, oh, go talk to her, but actually say, you know, um, we're worried. And, and I should be open about where this conversation is going, you know, we, but we feel we're, we're helping, we, sort, we want to support you, but um, we, we need this to be a bigger circle. Because it was taking up a huge amount of his time as well as, you know, out of all the employees he had, there was this one that just took up a far greater portion. Um, but the upshot was that she was also incredibly loyal, incredibly dedicated. She yeah. never missed a shift because that's where she came. And for an awful lot of people, whether it's there, there is a usually their work environment where they're actually finding that they can complete a task, task, um, have solace, um, and develop that self-esteem. So it's it's really difficult because you could be in a we will make it about you for a second in a in a yeah. super place yeah. at the moment, um, but then say. Um, this is a bit harsh. Say your vest had rung up this morning and said that actually your, your dog had dropped dead on the table. Um, they would that, be dead. That actually dropped, dropped you in a really. <laughs> <laughs> it would have. It would have. You're right. It would have. It would have destroyed me. That there's no two ways about then, it. And then the neighbour comes around and goes, you know, oh man, up, it's only a dog, and you'd 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 be you'd be hacked, you know, and and um, I'd be know, arrested. Really... Is the word you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I would be arrested. Well, let's go there. Let's go. But you know, to, to an outsider, it'd be like, what? He punched his neighbour because he, he he was you know flippant about you know needing to fan up. So that's that's sort of the difficulty, isn't it? In it so is much as um, there can be a time and a place, but and it can be really frustrating because we're learning new language all the time about you know all all sorts of different things. But I'm I'm learning about sort of all. all language that I've had from childhood um, that I, I now recognise is, is ingrained with various meanings and concepts that I hadn't fully appreciated. Um, and I'm happy to change that because whatever I say, whether it's mental health or um, regarding someone's you know, views on life, I don't want to offend anyone. And I'm, I'm interested in having those conversations with them and understanding people better. Um, I love being around people. It really doesn't matter to me what, where they're from or, or what their, their state is. So it's, it's about having those conversations. But to do that, um, I need to recognise that just shifting my conversation by saying experiencing mental health as opposed to suffering from mental health possibly makes that person feel slightly more sort of confident in themselves. And why would I want to erode that um, and potentially ruin a, a, a good conversation? Um, with that individual and there may be times that I'm just like wow this person's really wallowing in these issues 
Um, and he usually hands with close family. We kind of think, oh, you know, what, here again? Um, yeah. But that yeah. close family feel they can have those conversations. And it's often my really close family. Um, a lot of people who go on to, to complete suicide, you know, their, their close family didn't know anything about it. And it's because they don't want to step forward because they are now, they've moved from that life's difficult to I can't bear it anymore. Um, but they don't feel they can have that conversation because their family will be the one that rolls the arse and goes, oh, come on, you know, we've just put it together. Um, because we, it's not that we're trying to be quick to judge. We love them intently. It's just that we've, we've heard it and we kind of don't recognise where that shift's happening. And I suppose what I'm saying about language is you have to be relatively careful because however frustrated we get, that's that's kind of, that's on us. <laughs> Does it that is. make sense? It um, and it, if we're trying to be that friend or that companion or that listener to, to someone we care about, then it's really important that we put all that baggage down and go, okay, I'm, I'm phone off, computer closed. What is it you're actually trying? And actually, quite recently, I had to mental health first aid to my, my nine-year-old. And I, I, I am so glad I was trained because how I would have handled it before as a parent is you sat on my freshly ironed clothes um, in the back of the cupboard shouting at me and, and slamming and throwing stuff. Um, would have been very much a love of God, get off the island, get out of there, you know, stop being ridiculous. Um, and instead, we, we had a very different conversation, which led to a real sense of, of unity between us, of understanding. Um, and I, I, I've no doubt we'll end up in, in future pickles because he's heading towards his teenage years and that's what's going to happen. But um, it doesn't matter whether it's a child or an adult, it's, it's about sort of recognizing we're carrying our own baggage and our own frame of reference we need to put that down and 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 be prepared to to hear things um that we might feel are frustrating and annoying but it's your dog it's it's really important that we actually recognize the emotions and the attachments you have um and that sense of loss and therefore whilst i might think but it's only a dog or your neighbor might have said it's only a dog for you, that's that's enough to tear your heart out and want to cause some great pain. <laughs> oh, it is because I mean, often again, when when it comes to because uh, I think as well, there's also uh, a misunderstanding, and I don't want to be clumsy about this, but there's a difference between stress and depression, but they obviously come to they often come together, and yeah. depression stress is normally an external event or external circumstances and when you're in a, uh, a state of depression and whether it's stress or depression one of the things that can be incredibly hard for people to communicate is the pain they're going through and the confusion because one of the things they try to do often when they talk to you is explain something they don't understand themselves and it's like this is going on and this is happening and I, f I feel this but it, it doesn't communicate correctly in their own mind because part of the, the, the dilemma when you're stressed and and uh, and having difficult mental health is is the confusion going on inside yourself and that becomes yeah. very hard to communicate which then exacerbates the pain you're already in yeah absolutely and an awful lot of people um haven't spent a lot of their life um you know i know you've done um training in, in counseling um and looked at thoughts and emotions and and sort of digging deeper and understanding them um but for a lot of people that that's not something that you know they they link they don't understand why they've lashed out because they've never sort of picked apart um why why that's linked to this and how that actually is deeply rooted in i think last time we spoke we spoke about me dragging my husband off to um to counselling, um, to look at our very happy marriage, and, and discovering that it, it was, a, you know, it's, it's it's a hang up from my parents having had a happy marriage and then divorcing, and um, did, I yeah. never made that yeah, yeah. connection at all. Um, and interestingly enough, there, there was something that happened quite recently that made me realise there was there was something else. I was I went for another MOT, um, but this time with a, a lovely life coach who um, I shall introduce you to. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it's extraordinary how. You, you don't really always appreciate what's going on in, in even your own mind and, and the emotions that are linked to it. Um, and therefore it's really difficult to, to ask someone or have that expectation to someone. Um, 
of, of, of understanding that and, and they may not be able to communicate all the things about their health that, that are necessary um, and therefore sometimes it's it's about getting them either to, to see the right person or just be willing to talk to them um, and often you do get those spirals of conversation where they go round and round in circles because they, they can't equate it to um, neglect or loss or bereavement or a sense of being belittled or often, I mean, it, it's very frequent. Uh, as a parent, you'll, you'll find that you're using words that you don't mean to, but actually um, do undermine the child's confidence and a sort of, oh, you know, oh, don't, don't do that. That's, that's, that's a ridiculous thing to do. And you don't mean it as a, a sort of um, slight, but actually what they're learning is that by saying, be careful, you're saying, I don't believe you, I don't trust you. And when you tell them that that's, that's a silly thing to do, that you don't have confidence and that they're not capable, um, and actually those comments, I mean, I keep saying, my, my big one is quick, 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 quick. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Quick, quick, get your shoes on. Um, and actually they're, they're enjoying life. You know, at some point in the future as an adult, I will find myself talking to my fully grown child about step back, you know, smell the crappy, take life slower. Um, and it's it's me that's encouraging, this, you know, you've got to keep up. Um, but it does drive me insane. It takes 20 minutes to get shoes on. I don't, I don't understand how. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? Shoes. But it, it, it's interesting isn't it? because that is one of the, the dilemmas that is on one hand aware that, I mean, it must be like a nightmare for you in a sense, because on one hand, you're aware of, of the language you use and, you know, getting little kids to just sort their shit out. It doesn't take that long to get dressed for crying out loud and put your shoes on and be ready. But on the other hand, it's also actually causing you stress because you're always 20 minutes behind where their schedule. Yeah. And even if you try and like, right, I'm going to be really proactive. They'll find a way to use those 20 minutes you put in front of something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's an interesting juggling act because ultimately I have to ask myself, is it really important that they get to their school? That's really relaxed. And we're very rarely late anyway. Um, or is it more important that they go to school feeling happy, content and loved? Um, and it's a real, it's, it's really interesting because there's so many words that come out of my mouth that I go, what, what am I saying? That's really unhelpful. Um, and I will have to pick it apart. But we're also adults enough to be able to be honest about it and say, I'm sorry, I, I know what mummy's saying isn't, doesn't sound nice. Mummy's just getting cross because mummy's trying to get there because she's not going to let your teachers down and because I have an obligation that I need to fulfil and it's making mummy feel stressed. So, you know, the, the wonderful thing about kids is you can apologise and they'll just turn around and go, you know, I love you anyway, mummy. Yeah. <laughs> You're a bit, a bit over the top, but we love you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, yeah, no, that they are. And it is, it's, again, though, it's a good example of how life can just get on top of us. And... You know, you, you times that by five trips a day, uh, sorry, five trips a week, you know, for however many weeks a year, and then chuck in the car breaks down or fails an MOT. Yeah. You know, and it, it just, it builds up and it builds up. And it's, I think it's one of the most tragic things about stress is that it's never a single incident. So while you think you're coping, whilst you're in that mindset of, oh, do you know, what? I'll be fine, I'll go home, I'll have a cup of tea or I'll meet so-and-so and, you know, they don't turn up for that or they turn up late so you're not able to do what you want to do. And before you know it, you're six months down the line and that coping mechanism has actually been what's undermined you. Yeah, absolutely. And the... So I think we, we mentioned this last time about having a sort of a stress container um, and that you can fill it with all sorts of stress and, and we all have, you know, um, different level of sort of resilience and coping um, and different ways of being able to let out the stress, whether it's going for a walk or, um, you know, taking the dog for a walk maybe, um, going for a run, uh, catching up with friends, um, going to the cinema, what, you know, reading book, gardening, whatever it might be. Um, but there is, a, everyone will hit a point where something quite, quite, like like failing the MOT actually is is the, the the sort of proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back because actually your your pot is full you are done you are exhausted you're worn out and however trivial that might be 
Um, so often, actually, when someone's, you know, potentially very upset about something and stressing about something, it may seem like, you know, don't, don't worry, it's it's just, you know, one one paper, you've got the, the bit of, you know, information in that report wrong, don't, don't worry about it, it's okay. But it, it's nothing to do with that report. Um, you know, on another day, they would have got it right. It's because actually at home, there's all sorts of dramas going on because someone in the family's ill, because they're carrying the responsibility of, I don't know, the finance, whatever it might be, there's, there's everything else has overwhelmed them. And now cocking up the report is that, that final bit that's just made them feel that they're useless and, and can't cope and, and don't want to go on anymore. Um, so it's, uh, it, 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 you can find yourself in some very interesting situations for people whereby actually what's happening in front of you is actually only a small part of, of the bigger picture. That that, it does it does and um, i'm just whilst we're talking about time stresses i'm conscious of how long we've been talking because uh, it's been over an hour now um yeah. so where can people politics as well i don't really know how we got that but <laughs> it's yeah it's just because it, it's because the world we're in right now and I, I think probably is you know without getting down that road again is contributing to so much stress for people because everything seems to be political and people actually just want to get on their daily lives um, yeah, where is a good place for people to find you? Um, so I have a website called um, Developmental, so www.developmentaluk.co.uk um, and the courses are on there, so in a few weeks time I'm doing an awareness course which looks at language and stigma and understanding um, and we do some really great, great stuff. Some of it's it just some really fascinating stuff like um, when someone goes to hospital with a, a mental health case, do you know what percentage of cards or comments or calls they'll get? No. Zero. No one phones. They don't get any flowers, they don't get any cards. If you went to the hospital with a broken leg, you'd, you'd have some sort of acknowledgement. But actually, you go to, health, you'd go to hospital with mental health and the vast majority of people get absolutely no interaction whatsoever. They're just like... And it is this, it's our society sort of like, oh, you know, I don't want to, don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to upset them. I don't, you know, don't want to draw, draw attention to it. I'll, I'll just, you know. That's um, tragic, isn't it? Because that's it probably is. the oh, one man. time you could really do with people turning up and just putting an arm around you and just saying, look, it'll be yeah. all right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, with a broken leg, you know, it'd be, it'd be, you'd be annoyed, but you can read a book, you can get on with your own stuff and play on your phone. But actually, if your head's in such a mess, you feel so lost, so lonely, and so disconnected, and nobody bothers to get in touch. That's awful. That's that's a proper beasting, isn't it? Um, what? Well, yeah, and that's and no one means to do it. You know, that's that's not the intention of friends when they don't get in touch. It's just, you know, we 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 we're trying to give them the space to be able to cope with this. I think is the English, you know, the, our attitude, but actually, it's entirely the wrong one. Um, I think sometimes, um, and this can probably sound a bit harsh, I think sometimes we just don't want to be around people who are not in good mental health. I think people, yeah. when, when somebody, like you said, breaks their leg, you can have quite a comedic, upbeat conversation with them about it. Mm -hmm. But when people uh, are in hospital because of mental health, it, it's very difficult for a it's, it's you and I are, are very different in the sense that we have focused an awful lot of our careers on mental health. So we kind of probably navigate it with an ease that most people don't have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we were talking about language and being clumsy and saying things we don't mean or not understanding things. Um, but there's a part of that, that, had, that we're at a stage in our careers that it comes naturally. So, we might even recognise a mental health issue before someone else does. Um, yeah. Certainly when we know that somebody's in hospital with mental health, we, we you and I would probably instinctively reach out to them. You know, um, we would know, like if you heard a friend was going through something, you know, and I, I know that I do this, you know, um, you phone them up and you just like, I'll just say, look, I, I hear you're having a shit time. How are things going? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, to to, yeah, just like that, you know, and mm. and you might even put in a little joke and a little just to put them at ease because, you know, mm. like, look, I, I'm sorry that life has, has kind of hit you that hard that my the sound of my voice is a relief. You know, that must be awful for you. 
And you can kind of, you know, there's a knack to doing things like that. And I think for a lot of people who are not around mental health and have never been around mental health, that they, they just don't know what to do. And, and I think there's something almost human about not wanting to be around it. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, tribally, there, there's, you know, that sort of, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the weaker, the weaker individuals were, were left behind, you know, it's, that that's the sort of, but actually, when it comes to mental health, it's, it's nothing really to do about weakness, it's about trauma that we've, we've coped with, or tried to cope with, um, and, and has overwhelmed us. Um, or as you mentioned, just too many stresses in our modern day life, there is, um, just a ridiculous number of, of, of stresses now that we, we face and it's it's not it's not actually reasonable we have this this huge expectation you know once upon a time keeping up with the James, Jameses was a bit of a sort of we're well, not really tongue-in-cheek but a sort of aspirational kind of idea whereas now sort of this idea that you've got to be um, all, all things to all people um, and and everyone's just pulled really tight and really thin um, and then there's a sort of lack of understanding of where we fit in and it's amazing how many conversations I find myself in where people actually have, have lost their own sense of self of, of what they would like out of life you know our, our days on this wonderful planet are limited um, and I mean I'm not sort of going completely carpe diem here but there, there does need to be a bit of well actually I need to make myself the center of my universe and make myself fit and healthy because Otherwise, all those people around me um, aren't going to get the best out of me, and I'm not going to be able to look after them and inspire them and drive them and do do all the good things that I want to do in life um, and get the full enjoyment out of it if I'm not sort of actively looking after myself. Um, but actually, that's really hard to do because you know at the same time we're aware of the fact that everyone else seems to be juggling um, all these different things, and and there's a pressure for us to 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 do it too. And, um, it's very hard to then step back, back and go, actually, you know, this this is my cutoff point. You know, I, I don't want to work more than this. I don't want to do the more than this. You know, I, I need to, 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 to do this, to be able to earn this, to be able to be comfortable. But actually, I don't I don't need to have matching wardrobes and, you know, tablecloths and whatever it is. You know, it's just actually my life. Is, you know, this stuff that somehow true, gets caught. Cool. And in the, actually in England, it's particularly, we lived in Germany for a couple of years, they just don't have January sales. It doesn't happen. Um, you get to January and the couple of shops might try and sell off a couple of bits of Christmas stuff. But apart from that, if you want to buy a jumper, it costs you 70 quid and you look after that jumper for the next 10 years because you're not going to spend them that much on another. Whereas we, here, it's just like, you know, you pick up jumpers for a fiver and then you get rid of them in the summer and you go and get another one. And there's no real value or sense of appreciation or and, and it just fritters away money fritter because everything's so cheap you know i need this i need that i need this and um i, I just it worries me for our young just because it's such an unhealthy country um culturally in that sense there's lots of wonderful things don't get me wrong but it, yeah i mean i think that's probably a way we can look at it we we are so fortunate in this country we can actually focus on the things we're not great at yeah which is probably a good place to stop <laughs> Probably, I waffled a lot. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I genuinely, um, as uh, like, like I did last time, I genuinely appreciate you taking the time to talk, and and I I love the the way that you know f from my perspective, just just how you know like like you know, one of the things you and I were talking about, and we're now going to continue the podcast a little bit, is the fact that the the important thing about mental health is communication. So the very yeah. fact that you and I can have that communication and talk about it, hopefully for people listening, it might actually either A, encourage them to reach out to yourself um, or to reach out to other mental health um, first aiders. Um, but if nothing else, maybe they might just check in on somebody and say, hey, how's it going? I heard things were a bit tough. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's a, you know, a lonely neighbour or... Um, are elderly. Yeah. The, 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 some of the, the most shocking statistics for self-harm are uh, amongst the elderly. Um, everyone tends to associate self-harm as being um, young girls cutting, um, of which there is a, a horrendous number. Um, but actually it's the elderly that, that self-harm with, with medication and 
um, drink and smoking. Um, that's a, it's a it's a really big one because they're lonely. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of research. Loneliness literally kills. So actually, yes, if this inspires anyone to go out and just spend some time with with anyone at all. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll be really happy. So, uh, and that's a perfect okay. place to stop. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I do appreciate it. So that's the end of this episode of the David Watson podcast. As always, I really do hope you've enjoyed them. And look, if there was anybody out there who is struggling right now, it can feel frustrating. It can feel like you're on your own and it can be just mentally painful. If you can, please do your best to try and reach out to somebody. And if you're listening to this and you're worried about somebody, just ask them. Just just ask them if they're okay. You might be surprised how well just knowing that somebody cares about them is received.